Good afternoon, friends. Stephen Benoon here with Israeli News Live. We're going on a journey today of the likes you probably have never been on before down the road of redemption. We're going to be looking at scriptures that are redemption scriptures, and most people have no clue that's what they are. They have no clue that they're prophetic in, in nature. And in fact, I'm not even going as deep as what I could with you. And I know that just drives people crazy when I say that because they're like, why don't you just tell us everything? Well, the problem is you can't handle everything. Some of you can. I get that. And, and I don't mean that in a bad way. You have to remember, Jesus spoke in parables because he knew it was meant for some to understand and others, it was not meant for them at all. And he knew who could get it and who could not get it. And the thing is, I don't want to create strife and division. I want to bring about as much unity as I possibly can. So what I do is I try to share with you when I feel like that the, the group that we have that is listening in, that you're advancing enough to where you can now take this level and let's move into this level and go a little deeper. In fact, I got the book I'm writing, What Have Rabbis Missed and the Church Has Overlooked. Have it open on my other computer right now. This will be one of those issues I go very deep into into that book right there. In fact, I will go all the way when I go there. We're going to be looking at John chapter 1. That true light that came into the world, Jesus Christ, which he speaks about, you know, those that were, uh, uh, that were born, not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Those are the ones that actually make it into the kingdom, by the way, not flesh and blood. We're going to be looking also at John's gospel, chapter 2. What was this all about Jesus telling uh, his mother, woman, what have I to do with you? Mine hour has not yet come. Remember the story of turning the water to, uh, by the way, that's in, uh, not in Matthew, but in Luke, I believe is where that, no, John, John's gospel there. Where he turns the water to wine. Again, it's prophetic. Be looking at the Hebrew version of Matthew, chapter 16. Just briefly in this one here, blessed are you, Simon of Arjona, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. Reveal what? Who Jesus Christ truly was. Revelation. Now, these are just more the simplified uh, scriptures here. Revelation chapter 19, the marriage supper of the Lamb. That reminds me of a beautiful story, and I'll share that. I'll probably share that. In fact, I'll share that on Patreon. Beautiful story of a friend of mine years ago. I mean, many, many years ago. Gosh, oh my gosh. This has been almost 40 years ago, 38 years ago. The incredible dreams that she had, three identical dreams, three nights in a row. I'll share that with you. Amazing. This one here as well, uh, over in um, John's Gospel, Gospel chapter 14. <clears throat> and uh, this one really just sums it up. In that day that you will know that I am in my Father, <clears throat> I am my Father and you and me and I and you. This is where the fulfillment, believe it or not, that is the fulfillment of Genesis chapter 2. Hmm. Okay, if you're ready, I'm ready. Let's get going. Now, <clears throat> in Genesis chapter 2, verse 23, we'll start verse 22. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And the man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. When you read this, and follow verse 25, believe me, verse 25 is not without, it's, it's very important. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. You know, 
when their eyes came open and they realized they were naked, the part about being naked is that they're in the body of flesh. When God created Adam in the beginning, before we find in, what is it, in chapter 2 or chapter 3, this is where we find out that God makes him a physical, well, actually chapter 2, this is when he creates the man from the dust of the ground. But Adam initially was not that type of being. When they realized they're naked, it wasn't the fact of not wearing clothes. It was the fact that they were in a human body. That's what brought about the shame. That was called the awakening of their spirit, their soul, to realize who he really was and that somehow he got duped and put into something that didn't seem normal to him. That's pretty deep in itself. That's why I say not many people can really handle what's written in the Word of God in the first place. But it says here in verse 24, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Well, actually, Adam and Eve were one flesh before the separation came. And if you ever notice, when Eve was removed from Adam, the course of history of death setting in to the human race began right there. There is a place written in one of the Gospels that have not been canonized. Um, and I'm not sure if it was Thomas or which one it was. Like I said, scholars are... Um, there is more of a consensus that the Gospel of Thomas should be canonized, according to scholars. There are, it is a split over Philip, um, you know, and I understand. Uh, there's certainly things that are written in these that are, that are very hard to, to fathom for the mind. Uh, so I don't, I don't ever necessarily encourage uh, people to, to search that out because it, it is controversial. But um, in one place it says that if you ever become one again, if the man and the woman become one again, then death would cease to exist. That's why I say this is actually a prophecy. Because it's not talking about you and your wife becoming one. No. That's why he says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. This is a prophecy about Jesus Christ and you. Because the only way for the bride to enter back into her husband is through that spiritual union. That's why we read in the book of Revelation, if you remember this right here, right? And I heard as it were a voice of a great multitude and as the voice of many waters. Waters always represents the people. And the voice of mighty thunderings saying, Alleluia. For the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For, he, for the marriage of the Lamb is come. And his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Right blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true, and true sayings of God. There is a marriage. There is a consummation of the marriage in the bridal chamber when you become one with Christ. And it's not like in the perversion of the flesh. Not to say that that is not permissible, but the thing is, in this bridal chamber, it is becoming one with him in spirit, in mind, and in truth. When we read in the book of uh, 
John chapter 2. This is what he's talking about here. On the third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with you? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother saith to his servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. Verse 4 is really the key verse in this whole thing. His hour was not yet come. Because he knew that the true union of his bride and him would be at his death and resurrection when he would out, pour out the Holy Spirit upon the believers. When they would be filled with the light of God. They did set the six water pots of stone there in the manner of purifying the Jews, containing two or three firkins. Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up with, to the brim. And he saith to them, Draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear it. And when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor at the feast called the bridegroom, saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine. And when men have well drunken, then that which is worse, but you have kept the good wine until now. And that actually is also very prophetic in, in nature. In the beginning was set forth good wine. When Adam and Eve were one, it was a good wine. It was a great revelation because wine rep represents the stimulation of revelation. And the older it gets, the stronger it gets. But when they're well drunk, they get all the bad stuff. But he said, you kept the good wine until now. That's because Christ had come. So that's what the true meaning of this is, sitting there right before our eyes. If we look over here in John's Gospel, chapter 1, he says here, in hell, let's see. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, all things were made by Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life. The life was what? The light of men. All the light shine, And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. By the way, the human body is that darkness. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. That's because through the lineage of Israel he was born. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Flesh and blood does not inherit the kingdom of heaven. And so we have in Genesis here, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. The only way, by the way, the word in Hebrew right there, to, to cleave is like a glue. It's to bond so well together that it is like reaffixing back Eve back into Adam, that part that had been taken away from him to make her, now has become so back as if it had been re-stitched together as one being again. So the man that leaves his father and his mother was Jesus Christ when he had to leave Joseph and Mary in order to take and make 
his bride one with him. Like I said, it's a prophecy. It's not inclusive. Okay? It's not inclusive of every man on the face of the earth leaving his father and his mother. And we know this even in the Hebrew, like there, right there, there's his mother. Emo, his mother, not their mother. It doesn't say anywhere in there that therefore shall men, plural, uh, ishim, leave their father and their mother and shall cleave unto his wife and shall be one flesh. No, it's everything is singular. And if it's singular, then it is to Jesus Christ that it is a prophecy about. He's the only one. He is the second Adam as he is referred to often. In fact, what does that say? Let me look that up real quick. Adam. He was the second Adam, I believe, is how we can pull that up there. A life-giving spirit. Let's see. Nope. Let me pull down here. Maybe we can find it here. Let's see. <clears throat> All right. Yeah, here we go right here. First Corinthians. Let me blow this up big enough for you guys to see it. And that is 1545. Let's scroll down. Here we go right there. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam... A quickening spirit was made, doesn't even exist in there because he wasn't made. The last Adam, a quickening spirit. How, howbeit that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthly. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthly, such as are they also that are earthly, and as the heavenly, such as they are also the heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. You become one again. When Adam was made a physical being, that was the beginning of the fall. When it was even a greater fall, when Eve was taken from his side. Now, many would argue, well, God's the one that took it so he would not be lonely. I understand that. I understand that. But still, still though, it created a fall. Why? Because their temptation came. They ate of the tree they were told not to eat of. And death set into the human race. It weakened them. God will give you the desire of your heart, but you may not always have the best desire to start with. Think about it maybe in that light. Maybe that'll make more sense there. Adam may have been lonely, if you wanted to perceive it that way, and God gave him that desire of his heart, but knowing that wasn't the best desire. You do a little research, though, you might just discover some things that you never knew. Let's go back. Like I said, it's a prophecy. <clears throat> Make sure I didn't miss anything here. Um, Matthew chapter 16, and you're aware of this one, but I'm just going to take, and we're going to read it anyway. Jesus is asking them, uh, they said unto him, some, you know, he asked them, uh, his disciples saying, what do men say about me? They said unto him, some say he is John the baptizer, some say he's Elijah, some Jeremiah, one of the prophets. You know, they really believed in reincarnation. Let's face it, that's what they're implying here. Or when I say they, 
Because he's asking, what do they say of him? It could have been the Pharisees that had this belief. I don't really know the answer to it. I'm just saying that if you'll notice, their answer is everything is somebody else that came back from the dead, and now they're here again. Uh, we know that Pilate thought that because Pilate did think he was John the Baptist. Jesus said to them, what do you say about me? Simon, called Petros, answered and said, you are the Messiah, that is Christo, or the Christ, the Son of the living God who's come into the, who is to come into the world. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I say to you, you are a stone, and I will build upon you my house of prayer. The gates of Gehenna will not prevail against you, because I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatsoever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Notice, though, flesh and blood never revealed it to him. And you as well, when you have the Spirit, the Holy Spirit living in you, and you have been quickened by Christ, and you are one with Him, you too have the keys to the kingdom. I did a message on that. If you haven't seen it, go and watch it for sure there. Now we talked about Revelation already. We already went into this earlier about the marriage supper of the Lamb, right? And we did that one. Now the other one here, this is in closing, just as a reconfirmation that Genesis chapter 2, the truly prophetic verse there, that it is Jesus Christ that leaves his father and his mother and cleaves unto his wife, which you are that one that he cleaves to. And actually, we're not going to conclude there. Before we go there, maybe we need, let me see, this is, yeah, let me go to the one about salt real quick first so you understand it a little bit better before I do that one concluding scripture there in John's gospel there. John says, or Jesus says here, Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is very great in heaven. For thus they persecuted the prophets. At that time, Jesus said to his disciples, You are salt in the world. If the salt is neutralized in regard to its taste, with what will it be salted? It is fit for nothing but to be cast outside, to be trampled underfoot. You are light in the world. A city built upon a hill cannot be hidden. They do not light a lamp to place it in a hidden place where it cannot shine, but they place it upon a lampstand that it, that it might shine for all in the house. Thus let your light shine before every man to show them your good deeds, which are praised and glorified before your Father who is in heaven. Now, the thing that I wanted you to be able to see in this, that salt represents, when he says you are the salt of the earth. Because our bodies, if you take, in fact, there was a minister, I, I caught his video earlier today. I did really like it. It was this one here, the salt of the earth, the light of the world, the shocking meaning behind the biblical parables few people know about. Now, he goes and it's a beautiful message. It's one of the few I've ever listened to in, in, in its entirety. Um, it still lacks the depth of revelation, but it's still an amazingly well done message. And it's just from a different angle than what I'm sharing with you now. But in that message there, he shows also what salt, how the salt content of the Dead Sea is made, including potash, part of what your body is made up of. So when Jesus shows them that they're the salt of the, of the world, um, you, are, you are the salt in the world. If the salt is neutralized in regarding of its taste, with what will it be salted? The salt represents the earthly side of them, but there is a quickening of the spirit because flesh and blood does not inherit the kingdom of heaven. It is your soul that is quickened by the Spirit of Jesus Christ. That is what inherits the kingdom of heaven. That is where we become one with our mate as it is prophesied in Genesis chapter 2. That's why he goes on to say, you are the light in the world. That is because he had quickened them. 
And then you go to John, and we read here. This is really the full fulfillment. A lot of things he actually did. Like he said to the woman, if you knew it was when she, you know, he was thirsty, he asked her for a drink. She said, the well is deep. You have nothing to draw with. You're, you're a Jew or a Samar I'm a Samaritan. We have no dealings with one another. And Jesus says, if you knew who it was that was speaking to you, you would ask me for a drink of water. I'll give you water that you don't come to this well ever again. For I'll give you water that bubbles up from the belly. Now, she did not receive it at that time, but he spoke about it as if he would give it to her right then and there. And when his side was pierced by the Roman soldier at the cross, and forthwith came out, and the John testified of it, blood and water separated from his heart where they stabbed him at, from his belly, so to speak, as the analogy is given, flowed that waters of life. It represented the outpouring of his spirit. Because remember, the soul is in the blood. So we read here in uh, John's Gospel, chapter 14, If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter that, may, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. Hmm. <laughs> we just read that, right? Something very similar to that? But you know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Jesus Christ, the only one that was dwelling with them. That's why he could say they were the light of the world. He had anointed them for that purpose, but then he would be in them. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Yet a little while and the world sees me no more, but you see me because I live, you will live also. At that day, you shall know that I am in my Father and you are in me and I. In you. He that hath my he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my father, and I will love him, and I will manifest myself to him. There you have it right there. There is the fulfillment. It was the day of Pentecost. It was the not just the day, day of Pentecost, even after his resurrection, he breathed upon his apostles, he said, Receive ye the Holy Spirit. You see, when God had breathed in the nostrils of Adam in the beginning, he became a living soul. You remember that? Right there? Et ha'adam, afar min ha'adam, ve'ipak bepa'av nishmat chayim. He breathed in his nostrils the very breath of life, and that life, the chayim, is in the plural. It's from the tree of life. And by the way, the tree of life is the true knowledge of God. It's not the law. And that's what's going on right now. There is a war that is happening right now on this earth. And I need to make sure I say this in closing too. There is a war going on. We see it on the outside, the carnal war that is happening. And it is a religious war. Because the carnal man, Adam, that does not have the Holy Spirit within is warring for the flesh and the things of this world. And their kingdom is of this world. Their, their Messiah is Barabbas. As one of the great teachers of today mentioned and said, Barabbas is son of the Father as well. And he was an insurrectionist. And people that are wanting an earthly kingdom are fighting on that side. Oh, it's very religious. Got a lot of Christians supporting it as well. Looking for a savior, looking for a Barabbas, looking for an insurrectionist that they can put at the helm and overthrow the Romans. But the true battle, the true victor, 
will be those that fulfill Genesis chapter 2 at the end where the two have become one. That have embraced the son that has left his father and mother so that he could cleave to his wife and they truly shall become one. Just like we see here, he breathed, he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life in the plural form and that man became a living soul, chaya, singular. Le nefesh chaya, for the soul, life. That's what he became. But the plural was put in him. Why? Because Adam and Eve were one. And so all that God was, the tree of life, lie within them. But when they were separated and sin came, they lost the Holy Spirit that had been given to them from the tree of life. That's what caused the downfall. That's what caused the need for redemption. To bring back what was lost. And if you're going to truly redeem it, you've got to bring it all the way back to the way it was before. I hope in some way this message blesses your heart. And I pray sincerely that God opens your heart to understand what really lies there. You see, Adam and Eve never could produce that son. Think about that for a moment. Oh, they produced Seth, a very godly boy. After, you know, the Adam, you know, or excuse me, Cain killed Abel. They produced Seth. But you see, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Why do you think Jesus Christ had to come the way he did? He had to have a flesh body to be the kinsman redeemer. That's true. But he couldn't be born the typical way that a human is born. Why? That's not the way Adam and Eve was created in the beginning. So think about that. It goes a lot deeper than you could ever imagine. I'll give you one other one to think about. And you may not realize how much this has to do with what we're talking about. You remember when Jesus was on the cross and Mary was there? And his sister and the other Mary? And Jesus makes the comment to John. Our first, I think he says to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he looks at John and he says, Behold your mother. Let that one sink in for a while. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're listening to Israeli News Live. I hope it does bless you. Uh, definitely our, our website, IsraeliNewsLive.org. And by the way, if you happen to have a blog or a website, one thing that would really be a blessing for us is if you could mention Israeli News Live, uh, even maybe our name, Stephen Yana Benoon, in there link that, hyperlink it back to our website here, IsraeliNewsLive.org. It'll help us go up in the search engines there so that more people can find the messages that we share here. And if God lays on your heart, you want to support the work, please do. You can donate online, which is the fastest and easiest way, or by mail. And uh, our address, P.O. Box 156 Sunbright, Tennessee, 37. 872. God bless you. Thank you. By the way, this uh, this is not an interview with Dr. Sellers. Uh, it happens to be just a discussion in our Zoom meeting there, but uh, really fascinating uh, uh, message. We are going to interview Dr. Sellers very soon. I think you'll enjoy uh, listening to some of her thoughts, and we're going to bring her on here on Israeli News Live for just a regular interview here, hopefully in about within about a week. Uh, we can do that. Uh, her and her husband, just an amazing uh, couple there. I just want to say God bless uh, them and God bless you for listening.